I invite you to remain standing for our scripture reading. We'll be reading from Philippians chapter 4. Let's read God's good word together. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Do you ever buy something on accident? Like you didn't think you were going shopping, you were just looking. And then suddenly you have all this stuff, right? I mean, it just happens. You don't mean to. You don't really need anything, but, well, I guess I could use that. In fact, we have an entire holiday dedicated to it now. I don't know if you all have heard of this. We celebrated it last week. It's called Prime Day. Right? I mean, Amazon Prime Day. It's an entire day. There's no holiday except one they made up. It's like a holiday where they decide, hey, you already pay us for this subscription. Why don't you give us money on this day too? It's really nice. And so you didn't need anything, but you just start looking because there are lots of deals and no one wants to miss out. You're like, maybe I'll get a new microphone because I've been having trouble the last couple of weeks with it. You know, just, we'll just see. All I had to do was say it. We got great sound folks. But you just go and you check and you start scrolling and then you didn't want any of that stuff, but sometimes you just come upon a deal and it's just too much. You know, it's like 75% off. I don't know what this is. I don't need it. But how can I pass up a deal like that? And you know, if you live with other people, you know one of you is like excited about how much you saved and you're going to have the conversation like the other one's going to say, okay, how much did you have to spend to save that much money, right? I mean, I, I think that's a pretty common dynamic, but, but we just end up with stuff and, and we don't even need it. And it even happened to me this year. I'm not making fun of anybody. I was looking at Prime Day deals and then I didn't buy anything from Amazon, but later, like I had, I had been prepped for this. And, uh, and then I saw something, I was like, okay, I'm going to buy. I bought something from a different vendor on Prime Day because I saw something on it. I mean, it's, it's amazing. They're good at what they do. But, but we're susceptible to it. We, it's, it's easy for us to find our desires tweaked and, and led and, and formed in these different ways, and we end up doing these things that we hadn't planned. That's what we're going to talk about today. How, how does our desire get transformed, and how can we allow God to transform it in the way that God intends? And so we're wrapping up our sermon series that we've been going through for the last few weeks. It's called Life Together, and we've been going through the book of Philippians because it's, it's a book that really illustrates what life can look like in the community of faith. We've been talking about um, what it looks like whenever we live together because we are better together as we learned in life in, in week one, that we are not made to be isolated individuals. Was it, I think Hopkins said, no man is an island, no person is an island. But, uh, but we're not made for that. We're not made to be isolated and, and autonomous completely. We need other people. We're better together. And, and so we talk about community, and, and it, it's, it, it's marketed to us. And sometimes we even do that in church, uh, in different churches. And, and this is what Ruth Haley Barton says about that. Sometimes we, we don't quite live up to what we're promising. She says, community is the most overpromised and underdelivered aspect of the church today. And uh, really, we're working hard here to make sure that's not the case. But we have this, it, maybe you grew up with this, but we have this kind of, this kind of pared down version of what fellowship means. That, that's the word for community in Greek, is, is the word that we translate fellowship. And, uh, and in a lot of places you have a fellowship hall, and that's where you have coffee and donuts. And uh, that's what fellowship means, is conversations you have over coffee and donuts. We, we, ha we don't have a fellowship hall, we have a gathering space, maybe for that reason. <laughs> but uh, but we, we, we don't just, it's not just sharing food. When we say fellowship, that word in Acts 2.42, we say it every week. We're talking about partnership. 
about partnership, about actually coming alongside one another, of sharing life, of helping, and joining together in a mission that's greater than any one of us. And that's what we see in the book of Philippians and Paul's relationship with the church there in Philippi. And, and so he had started that church. You can read about that in Acts chapter 16. That's what Pastor Mark talked about in week one. And five or ten years later, uh, Paul was writing back to them. He was in prison, and he was writing to this church that had been caring for him. They had sent money uh, with a man named Epaphroditus, and he, was, he needed it because he was in prison. And in the Roman prisons, you did not get fed. If you had friends and family who brought you food, then you ate. And if you didn't, then you didn't eat. And, and so they were providing for his sustenance for the things that he needed. And so he was writing back to them as a result of that. And that's the context of, of this letter, of this mutual care that this, this community has with Paul. And so that's where we started. Then in week two, what we talked about is that um, the Christian life is not just something we do in private as individuals. It's something that we do publicly. It's a public act of living as a citizen of heaven. That's what Paul says in Philippians 3.20. He says, you are citizens of heaven. And in the same way that our citizenship defines the way that we live in, in the United States or, or whatever country you hold citizenship, it also defines the way that we live as citizens of heaven. Kingdom citizenship requires sacrifice and a Holy Spirit power to achieve a unity by living like Jesus. He sets the example for us. And what Paul tells them is, is what that example looks like. He says this, he says, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. What does our life together look like? It looks like emptying ourselves on behalf of others because that's what Jesus did so that we might enjoy the blessings that he offers to all of us. And so we, we empty ourselves as well of privilege, of power, of the things that we have so that others might experience those blessings as well. And far from being drudgery or, or something that's, that's awful for us, that, you know, no one's like, I'm going to make a sacrifice today, and it's going to be awesome, right? I mean, we're not super excited about that. But whenever we do that, Christ-like sacrificial service is actually how the Philippians are to live a common life of humility and joy. It actually leads them to joy, and that's the same thing. Whenever we sacrifice on behalf of others, it leads to joy. Maybe you've experienced this. If you've been on a team, you, the, it's those memories of, of really being in the trenches together that bring you together. And you know, you may you may not have enjoyed them at the time, but whenever you get back together and talk about the the experiences you had, those are the things that you talk about. They're the things that bring you together and are actually the sources of the joy that you experience. And so that's where we were week two. Then in week three, what we saw was that Paul was a man who had this great pedigree. I mean, he knew exactly where he came from. He knew about his lineage. He was raised right, as, as we might say in Oklahoma. And, uh, and he also kept the law faithfully, and, and so well that, uh, that he even persecuted people who didn't keep it right in his eyes. And, and yet, despite all of that, despite his pedigree and his faithfulness, Paul considered it all of it a loss compared with knowing Jesus. That was the most important thing for him, and everything else not just was less important, but it was actually a loss. It was actually a negative on the balance sheet. And so this is what he says. He says, more than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And what we saw last week is that, you know, if we're pursuing the wrong things, it doesn't matter how successful we are. If, if we're going after the wrong goal. If we're going after the wrong things, then it doesn't matter. Like the race to the bottom is not a race worth winning, <laughs> right? And yet sometimes we find there, but it's like, but I really want to beat them, right? I'm going to get there before they do. I don't care where it is, but I'm going to win. And we get in that mindset, and we find ourselves in places that we don't want to be. And we end up sacrificing things that we would never want to sacrifice if we were thinking about it. And, and so what, what happens whenever we say we're going to focus on the things that matter most together, pursuing the way of Jesus together, it enables us to seek the things that matter most. We can do that as a community. And the thing that we're seeking has tremendous power to shape the way that we live because much of our behavior, it flows from our desires, from the things that we desire. And sometimes we're conscious of that. A lot of times we think we're conscious of the things that are driving us, and often there's a lot more to it than that below the surface that we don't even realize is going on. We have these desires that cause us to do the things that we do, whatever that may be, and our deepest desires come from God. You know, sometimes that word desire has a bad connotation or it's like kind of risque, but I mean, our deepest desires are gifts. They're things that God gives us. They're, they're the desire for connection with God and with one another. They're, they're a desire for a life that is meaningful, for, for work that makes a difference, that, that helps people. People. And yet these good soul desires are easily influenced by the people and the media around us. 
Maybe you've experienced this. You're talking to someone and something that you never thought you wanted before, they start talking about something that they have, and you're like, huh, yeah, I need some of that in my life, don't I? And just your exposure to them actually changes that. And I don't know, maybe you haven't experienced this in this aspect of your life, but one area where I see this is, is here. Does anyone need new insulated drinkware? <laughs> like, you can't have enough. I thought I was done, and then I have like three more now. I've got two at my seat right now, different brands, because, you know, I need this size for this situation, and in this circumstance, it needs to fit in my cup holder, and in this, I don't, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of absurd. I got, I got a Hydro Flask as a gift a few years ago, and I thought I was done, and I was not. Right? I mean, we just keep getting more and more, and that's how it happens, right? I mean, I don't, I don't know about you. I'm not looking to, uh, to get so much drinkware that I have to, like, add new cabinetry to my kitchen. <laughs> but it just happens because we're exposed to it, and we see, oh, what's, what's that that you've got? Like, oh, that'll fit in your cup holder, and it's got a straw? Like, okay, okay. where'd you get that? <laughs> right? Prime day. Yeah. <laughs> But, but the things that we're exposed to, all of the things that, that we see, they shape us, and, and we find ourselves desiring things that we didn't choose to want, but we want them because of the things that we're exposed to, because of the people, the voices, the advertising that we're exposed to. And uh, Luke Burgess is a writer. He, he says it this way. He says, every artist has experienced it. They may have had a lifelong desire to tell the truth, to make art that expresses something important, yet they have a, co- a competing desire to sell their work in the marketplace to be accepted, to be praised, to get reviews, to stay on top of trends that can change from year to year, month to month, day to day. And so these deep soul desires that we have to to make work that is meaningful ends up being corrupted by by these other desires. And really, that's, that's the source of much of our unhealthy behavior whenever we're chasing status, whenever we're chasing wealth, whenever we're chasing attention, whenever we're chasing power. It comes from these desires that have been corrupted these good desires that have been corrupted. And, and uh, Burgess talks about the difference between thick and thin desires. That's how he, he talks about thick desires are the soul desires, those things that are deeply ingrained in us, like the, desi- the, the kind of thing that happens whenever you sit down at a dinner table with people you love. You have this thick desire for connection, and, and yet it's replaced by this thin desire for you know, just like a hit of connection that happens whenever you text someone or you're chatting on WhatsApp. And it's like that replaces the thick desire for the real relationships that nourish us. And and these thin desires, they drive us away from community and into a life focused on accumulation because we allow our desires to be corrupted and and they're corrupted towards gaining things for ourselves. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that I've found for me is that, you know, the the better things go, the more isolated I can become, you know, the more successful I am from from a, a financial, from a status perspective, it's easy to become more isolated. And, uh, you know, one of the things, I'm going somewhere with this, but one of the things that I really liked in third grade, uh, everyone looked forward to third grade because that's when you got to do the medieval unit. And what's exciting about the medieval unit, you got to build a castle. And the coolest part of a castle, you may not know this, but it's, it's the portcullis and the drawbridge. And you can keep anybody out. And, uh, and you're like, sorry, drawbridge is up. You're on the other side of the moat. See ya, not hanging out with me. And I realized we have that today. Most of us have that because I, I just, whenever I get home, I drive into my garage and I lower the drawbridge and uh, nobody's coming in. I don't have to see anybody else, right? I mean, you can have it closed before you even get out of your car. You don't have to talk to your neighbors. You don't even have to know them. And really, the more successful we are, the easier it is to isolate ourselves. The more we accumulate, the easier it is to separate ourselves from community. And, and that all happens because we're trained to want these things that really sound nice but aren't worth wanting, right? We end up with a thousand water bottles and nobody to share a drink with. And, and so what we have to do, we have to train ourselves to want things that are really worth wanting, We have to actually focus our attention to pay attention to the things that that we're paying attention to, that that we're allowing to shape our desires so that we can have a life that's worth wanting. And so that's really what what kind of unites what Paul's talking about in the the last chapter of Philippians. He gets kind of practical in this part and starts giving them some some just kind of practical life advice. So at the end of his letter, he he gives a series of instructions for standing firm, that's a phrase that he uses, and, and for living well. And so this is where he starts. He says, and you may remember this if you've ever been to vacation Bible school as a kid, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. And so that's what he says. He says, rejoice 
always. Not just whenever things are going well, not just whenever you scored a great deal, not just whenever you're feeling happy, but always and in all circumstances. And, uh, you know, sometimes that feels like someone's just like, hey, you're having a rough day, why don't you smile? And you're just like, thanks, that fixed it, wow. If I would have thought of that by myself, oh my gosh. But, but remember where Paul's writing from. This isn't somebody who's just walking by and like, hey, chin up. He, he's, he's in prison. He's in prison. He's actually living this, and he's modeling rejoicing in all circumstances and focusing on others. I think 11 times I counted, he uses some form of the word joy in the book of Philippians. It's four chapters long. This is a joyful letter, and he's writing as he's imprisoned. Now, I don't know about you. The only time I've been to prison is whenever I I was visiting for a class. It was a pretty cool class. But uh, I was happy to get out. And, and, and I was not rejoicing whenever I was inside. It was kind of scary at times. But, but Paul is rejoicing in that circumstance. And so that's what he says, rejoice in the Lord always, not just sometimes, not just whenever it seems like things are going great, but always. And he helps them let them know how to do it. This is, this is what he says next. He says, let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. And, and that word gentleness may not be a great, I don't know if that's the best translation. What, what scholars say is what that actually means is, is your regard for others. If you want to get fancy, you would say your magnanimity, if I'm saying that right. That's a hard word for me to say. But, but your care for others. And, and whenever you're in bad circumstances, whenever you can take the focus off of yourself, it helps a lot. And it actually can help others, too. And, and so what Paul's teaching them is joy doesn't depend on our external circumstances, but on God's presence, on God's presence. And whenever we know that God is with us, as he says, the Lord is near, then we, can't, we can focus not just on our problems, but on God's presence and on helping others on helping others. The next thing that he says is whenever you're faced with worries, we offer a request to God with gratitude. And so here, here's, here's how he says it. He says, do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And again, do not worry is one of those things like, thank you, like for the unhelpful advice. I, if I knew how to do that, I would stop right? I mean, it's not just a matter if you're worried about something, it's not just a switch that you can turn on. That would be a really nice feature of our brains if they work that way, but they don't, right? And and I think one of the things that's important for us to realize, sometimes people will teach this in a way that, um, and it wouldn't happen here, but sometimes people teach scriptures like this and others in a way that says that if you worry, he says don't worry, and if you worry, it's a lack of faith. That's, that's not what Paul is saying. He's also not saying that, that if you're worried about things, and particularly whenever you think about things like anxiety disorders, if you're suffering from things like things, it also doesn't mean don't get help. It doesn't mean if you just pray about it, it'll be fine. I mean, Paul, I think, would be in favor of therapy and all kinds of interventions that are helpful. But, but what he is saying is, is that whenever we're in those situations, we don't have to carry that alone, that we can offer it to God, that we can say, this is, I'm, I'm really struggling with this, help me. Please do something. Please walk with me in this. And, and, and it helps to shift our attention again, because again, our, our attention shapes our desire. And so what he says is, do not worry, but offer it to God. Change, shift your focus from the issue to the one who is with you and offer that with gratitude. And you all know the power of gratitude. This, this is uh, probably not something that I have to tell you about, but you know, one of the things about gratitude, whenever we focus on the blessings that we do have, it transforms everything else. And uh, I, I experience this whenever, uh, whenever we um, go to our garden and have some, we can actually pick, uh, pick tomatoes. We got about zero last year, but we've actually had some this year. This is one of our first harvests. Um, we had some, they're, not, they're like Roma tomatoes, but not quite. And then we had a poblano pepper um, up top. The two peppers on the left, I forget what they're called, but th- th- they were not supposed to be picked yet, but I have a two-year-old, so stuff happens. She, she's an eager harvester. So uh, I wasn't real grateful for that. But one of the things that happens whenever I eat a tomato that, that Courtney and I have grown, we know what goes into that, right? I mean, we've done the work of, of planting our tomato plants. We didn't grow them from seed, but we planted them. We water them. We uh, have to remember like not to overwater them whenever we get as much rain as we did. What a weird summer. But, but we know what goes into that. So whenever we eat it, we're particularly grateful because, because we're focused on the blessing that we've received. Like, I mean, there are a few things better than a tomato that you've grown in your own garden. And so we're conscious of that. I think that's something that happens whenever we offer things to God, and then we can pay attention to the things that God has blessed us with. We're more focused on what God has given us, and, and it shifts our perspective. And instead of worrying about the things that we wish that we had, we're grateful for the things that we do have. Now, that doesn't mean that, that there aren't concerns that we have that aren't valid. Of course, they're valid. But it does mean sometimes the things that we worry about, like, oh my gosh, 
that guy that I barely know sent me an email that was kind of mean. And like, when you can't stop thinking about that, God's like, have you done what you could to mend the relationship? Then don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Be grateful for the gift of forgiveness. And so it shifts our perspective whenever we can say thank you and whenever we can be grateful. And as we give thanks, as we trust God with our needs, our desires are transformed and we have peace. God helps us to desire the things that are worth desiring. This is where he goes next. He says, whenever we do those things, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. So he continues on this theme of desire. He continues teaching us about the things that we should focus on. And whenever we do those things, whenever we focus on what's true and excellent, we learn to desire the things that are worth wanting, and we can let go of the rest. And so here's where he goes next. And I think this is a point that he really wanted them to get because uh, it's a really long sentence. But he says, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing... So are you catching that? And he's he's still going. Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Think about things that are good, that are excellent, that are true. Um, Some of the ways that people talk about this in theology and philosophy are the good, the beautiful, and the true. Think about those things. Pay attention to those things, and you realize, like, I'm good. I have enough. If I don't cash in on a single deal today, then I still have enough. We realize that, that the things that of God, we realize that we can actually focus on and desire the things that matter most. And the things that we're tempted to chase, those things begin to fade away because we're not giving them attention. So this is how he, he continues. He says, keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. And that's what... Uh, that's what he knows about our desires is not just that there's something that we choose and even something that we train on our own, but they're actually things that are shaped by the people around us. We need people that we can imitate. We need examples. And, and so he says, imitate me, which we talked about last week. It, it sounds a little bit egotistical in, in our culture, but Paul was someone who knew he had given his life to following Christ. He, he knew what that meant. He'd been doing it longer than the people in Philippi. And so he encouraged them. He said, look, I, I I don't do this perfectly, but imitate me because I'm imitating Christ. And we need those models that will help us. Because if we're just chasing people who are chasing things that are not worth chasing, then we're going to be chasing those things too. And, uh, and whenever we have good examples, whenever we have good people that we can imitate, it helps us to let go of the things that don't matter. And I love the way Elaine Heath puts it. She says, we have to give up day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment, our little fiefdoms. That's a, a $5 word for sure. We have to give up our petty preferences, our exaggerations, our bigotry, our resistance to mercy, our vindictiveness, our craving for attention, our hiding from our own gifts and call. Her list is a lot longer. That's about half of it, but I think you get the point, right? We have to let go of those things because they're not those things that lead us to a life worth living. And then we learn to be content. We learn what enough means because we find it in God whenever we focus on the things that are good and beautiful and true. And so that's where Paul goes next. He he tells them about the secret of contentedness. And so he he moves on. He talks about the gift that they've sent to him with Epaphroditus that occasioned the letter. And uh, he gives thanks for the Philippians gift, but he also demonstrates the power of being content. And so he's like, thank you for this gift. I I also know what it is not to have those gifts. And and so it's, it's interesting in this exchange that happens. But Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. Not that I'm referring to being in need. Now, that feels a little underhanded, right? Like, thank you for this gift. I didn't need it. But it it was nice of you to think of me, although I'm completely autonomous and have no need of anything. (laughs) I know that strikes us as weird, but he says, I've learned to be content with whatever I have. And and so this, again, is one of those things that's a little bit lost um, to us 2,000 years later and and really distant from that culture. But but the reason Paul's talking like that is, is one, he's trying to make clear that this was a gift that, that wasn't from obligation. That, uh, that they didn't owe him, and so that's why, that's why they uh, gave it to him, so they could check that off and, and get the balance sheet back to zero, and also not that, that he, he was dependent on them for it. And so it's making sure that the, that the relationship is a relationship that is built on equality. But he's also letting them know he's, he's teaching them what it means to be content. It's something that he's learned, and so he takes this opportunity to help them to learn it as well. And what he tells them 
is, uh, is, is that whenever we have enough, whenever we put our trust in Christ, then we can find contentedness in any circumstance, even whenever we're hungry and cold in prison. We can learn to be content whether we have much or little because Christ is our strength. And so this is how he goes, and you probably know the, the end of this, but he says, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Have you heard that last verse, right? I mean, it's one that we kind of like frame and put on t-shirts and coffee mugs and things like that. And it's interesting, you know, any verse that gets lifted out of context, we run the, the risk of losing what's actually being said. And this is one that like, I, I'm not sure about this, but I have this kind of vague impression, like this was a verse that we'd have like when we were playing high school football and whenever you're going into the weight room to work out and uh, you were trying to, to increase your bench max, you didn't know if you could lift this weight yet, but you know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Whoop! All right, bumped up, <laughs> 250. Now, I mean, that's the kind of way that we use it. We actually use it in a way that, that makes it more about self-actualization, about achieving goals. And, you know, I know that, and, and that's a verse that helps people sometimes as well. And so I don't want to minimize that. But it's also not what Paul's talking about. I mean, he's not talking about being successful. And what he's talking about is enduring things like being in prison. It's about, it's about continuing whenever we feel like we don't have the strength to continue. Scott McKnight gets at uh, kind of the tension. He says, I can get irritated when my computer responds slower than I think it ought. Where Paul was learning to live without food and shelter and safety. That's a really different circumstance, right? And so whenever we, we hear that verse, whenever we hear all things that I can do all things through, through Christ who gives me strength, it, it's not about self, self-actualization or achievement. It's about enduring suffering. And so it's about enduring things, like whenever you're going through a really tough time at work and you don't know how you're going to get through it, it's about Christ's strength allowing you to keep going. Whenever you've got one or two or three more treatments and you just don't have the strength, you don't know if your numbers are going to be high enough, you don't, you're tired and don't feel like doing anything, that's whenever Paul's saying, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Whenever you've got a broken relationship and just really struggling and lost on how you're going to deal with that, that's what Paul's talking about. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because with Christ's power in one another, we can endure all kinds of hardship of the one who gives us strength. And Paul shows us how to do that. This is a guy who's rejoicing in prison because Christ is his strength. And and here's the thing. We need one another because a transforming community, a a community that really is transformational, it helps us discern those thin desires from those that are given by God, those desires that are corrupted from the things that are really deep. I saw this uh, a tough situation a friend was telling me about. He, he, um, there's some people who were having an affair, two people that he knew, and, uh, and they decided they were going to leave their spouses and, uh, so that they could get together, and they were excited, and, and they came and talked to him, and were asking, like, what do you think about that? And he's like, well, you know, um, I mean, I think that you're infatuated with each other because this is new and exciting, and your old relationships are not, and in a few weeks or maybe a few months or maybe a few years, the same thing's going to happen because you're taking your problems with you. And not only that, but you're blowing up your lives and doing something terrible to the person that you made a commitment to. And uh, they just kind of looked at him and said, you know, we've told several people about this, and everyone else told us they were happy for us. They had no one who would tell them the truth, who would tell them this is a big mistake that's going to negatively impact a lot of people. And probably, hopefully, most of us are not in a situation like that, but I wonder how many of us have people in our lives who, whenever we're on the verge of making a big mistake, will tell us the truth, will help us to know that, no, that's not a road that you want to go down. We need those people who will tell us the hard truths, who will stand with us and who are willing to correct us whenever we're going astray, whenever our deep desires have been corrupted and we're looking for an easy way to fulfill them. And so we need people who ask us those important questions, who ask us the questions like what what Thomas Merton says. He says, ask me not where I live or what I like to eat. Ask me what I think I'm living for in detail and ask me what I think is keeping me from living fully for the thing I want to live for. We need those people who ask us, what are those deep desires that God has given you? And, And how are you living for that? And what are the things that are getting in the way? Because we, we can't discern those things on our own. We need wise people who will speak into that so that we can actually know that this desire 
is worth wanting and it's worth chasing after in this way. We need people who will give themselves to us, who are willing to risk hurting our feelings so that they can help us to find God's desire for us. And as we do this together, after we walk these pa- whenever we walk these paths together, whenever we're living life together, at the core of it, it's not about us. It's about God's self-giving in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul talked about in chapter 2. He said, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself. Didn't look down from heaven and say, That's really too bad, those poor people. Someone needs to do something. He emptied himself, became one of us, and lived with us and died our death for us so that we might experience his grace. And so Paul gives him this advice. He says, if you have that mind, he says, let the same mind be in you. This is what it looks like. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to others, look not to your own interest, but to the interest of others. And as he concludes, after talking about the gifts of God's grace and their gifts that are shared with one another, he leaves it with, with the gift, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Because that's the gift at the core of it all. And if that's the kind of Savior that we follow, then to live a deep life together, we have to be willing to give ourselves. It's not just something that we can walk into and, and it'll just, we don't have to give anything and we'll get a lot. We've got to give ourselves if we want to have relationships that are deep and meaningful, if we want to have a life that is worth wanting and that's worth living. But whenever we do, it's beautiful and it's life-changing. One of the things that I think illustrates it really well, I don't know uh, uh, where you all have been the last few years, but, uh, but a few years ago, a movie came out um, called Encanto. Anyone? And I had a little one in my house, and so it was pretty much on repeat. That was, I think that was also the time whenever we were doing school at home, so it was like, okay, we got through the lessons, I've got to work now, like, here, watch Encanto a few more times. And, uh, and that's kind of how it worked. But, but there's this, my favorite scene, uh, it may be kind of weird, I don't know if anyone else thinks of it this way, but, uh, but toward the end, um, this, this family's had kind of a falling out, and it's been really tough, and, and they, they lose their magical powers, they have magical powers, and then they lose them. And, and then they, they lose their house as well, the whole house falls apart. And so the family comes back together, and they've got to rebuild. And, and so they start, and of course, it's to the background of song, right? I mean, all great Disney moments are. But, but they're starting to work and doing all this work, but you can tell there are only a few of them, and it's going to take forever. And then one of them asks, there, there's this sound welling up of voices, and somebody says, what's that sound? And uh, little Antonio says, I think it's everyone in town. And then the community shows up. And what do they say? Lay down your load. We're only down the road. And they come, and they rebuild it together. The community shows up at the time that they need them most. And see that moment there. They bring the things that they have. And it's not, no one has magical powers that are suddenly going to rebuild the house. But little by little, people give what they can. And the community is blessed through it. Whenever we come together, whenever we offer the gifts that God has given us, whenever we set aside the desires for, for selfish things, for things that we think are going to make us content, but only leave us wanting more, then we can have the kind of life that God has for us. But we can rejoice no matter what. We can be content in all circumstances because God's power in Jesus Christ gives us strength and we have one another to carry us in times that are hard. And so here are the action steps I want to give you this week as we try to live this out together. Now, I want to encourage you, train your attention by focusing on things that are good and beautiful and true. What are the things that you give your attention to? Are they things that, that are telling you how awful the world is? Are there things that are telling you how awful certain people in the world are? Maybe people who think differently. Are there things that are maybe just making you want more, right? I mean, just scrolling through Amazon, that, that leads down a dark path. Uh, if you're just looking at other people's houses to try to figure out where might I live, then you're never going to be content with your own house. And so think about the things that you're paying attention to, and then pay attention to things that are actually good and beautiful and true. Pay attention to the things of God. And then identify one situation that you need to trust God with, where you've been trying to, to go it on your own and you just, it's really worrying you and keeping you up at night. How can I trust it to God? And then offer it to God with gratitude that God is with you. And you don't know how God is going to show up or how it's going to work out, but you know that God will never leave you alone. And then ask a trusted person to help you discern which desires are worth pursuing. 
asking that question that Thomas Merton asks. Like, here, here's what I'm going after. This is where my career is headed. This is where my family life is headed. Am I actually, is this actually worth pursuing? Is the way that I'm pursuing it actually leading me to a place that I want to be? Because we need those people who can speak into our lives, who can guide us and help us to have a life that's worth wanting. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you that you've given us a wonderful world of abundance, and there are so many blessings that we have. I pray that you would help us not to focus on the ones that we don't have, but on all that we do, on all the ways that you've blessed us, and particularly with the gifts of one another, of meaningful and deep community, and of your Son. And during the times that are hard, we offer you our concerns, we offer you our struggles. Help us to rely on his strength and not our own. And in everything, help us to seek you. We thank you for Jesus' example, the way he emptied himself for our sake. And we thank you that he taught us even how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.